I'm Aaron Kohler, uh, sitting here in Yeshiva University. I'm here with Michael Eisenberg of Aleph Capital and the author of The Vanishing Jew, a really insightful, interesting book on the Book of Esther. And we're going to spend a few minutes today talking about some of the key scenes, episodes, and themes in that book. So, Michael, let's, uh, hey, let's start with wait, where let, And I'm here in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Uh, I'm Professor at, Aaron Kohler sitting in New York, who is the author of Esther and Ancient Jewish Thought. This is true. All right. So, yeah, it's good to, it's good to see you. It's good to be together, virtually at least. Likewise. Um, the, the, uh, the book starts a couple of times. Like, there's a bunch of, of beginnings to the story. Um, obviously, the first chapter, first parak. Then you have the introduction of Mordechai and Esther. She becomes queen. Um, but, uh, but let's pick up the story at the end of the second chapter, where we have this slightly surprising, very short episode a plot on the king's life, Mordechai and Esther, you know, it's, it's sort of hanging there, and yet it seems to be crucial for what unfolds. So, Michael, what do you see in that, uh, in that episode? Yeah, one of the things that you referenced in some of our earlier conversations is that the sixth parak is actually the turning point in the story. I think that's, that's true in many ways. And uh, there, Ahasuerus, in the middle of the night, remembers Mordechai, who uh, snitched on Big Tan and Teresh, suggesting that they were going to be the ones that, that killed the king. And this memory of Ahasuerus is what helps turn the story. And that, that tells us that the end of the second parak, where the story of Bigtan and Teresh is told initially, those somewhat enigmatic three psukim are, are actually critical for the fundamental understanding of the story. It's buried there in three verses at the end of, at the, end of the second parak. Now, the other thing that I think uh, points to the fact that it's fundamental is immediately thereafter, it says, uh, what happens right after that? Immediately thereafter, which by the way is a few years, but either way, in the in the language of whoever wrote whoever wrote the story, it is connected to the previous story. And something about Big Tan and Teresh led to the uh, rise of Haman, the great anti-Semite of that generation, uh, to power. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, the Achar Advarim Ela is really fascinating because it's. It's totally surprising. I want, to, I want to come back to Big Time Teresh in a second, but but that linkage is fascinating because in that little story, in that little story, Mordechai saves the king's life, and then you know we're, we're sometimes misled by the by the fact that there's a new chapter. But if we just read straight without breaking for a new chapter, uh, then it says, and then right after that, the king promoted, and we're all like, obviously he's going to promote Mordechai. I mean, he just saved his life. And instead, you get the king promoted Haman. You're like, who? Like, who's Haman? That's totally surprising. It's also the first time of what's going to turn out to be a number of times where Haman and Mordechai switch places, right? What's supposed to happen yes. to Mordechai happens to Haman and uh, vice versa. So that's, that's the first of those instances. And, and, and why do you think that it was Haman who was promoted and kind of what was his job, perhaps, that, you know, in the kingdom? Me'al kol on top of yeah. all of the rest of the ministers. So, I, I mean, the... Let, let me say that the text that hasn't introduced him yet, um, you know, the, uh, there, is a, there is a view that he's been mentioned under a different name in chapter one. But yeah, so what do you think about that? The Big Tan and Teresh, their, their names are, are uh, I don't want to say that they're similar, but like Big Tan, Teresh, Haman do seem to be linked in this, in this, uh, in this passage. You see, you see a linkage there? So I do. I think I think that the the that actually Haman assumes the roles of Bigtan and Teresh, and that's not an accident. Um, Bigtan and Teresh have a uh, a unique status. First of all, they're eunuchs, right? The Megillah takes a time to tell us the eunuchs, and second, it calls them a very interesting name called Shomrei Hasaf. Yeah, they are Shomrei Hasaf, and um, there have been multiple although not a huge number of explanations offered up as to what that word means, Shomrei Asaf, there is uh, uh, the Rashbam, uh, who, who, who suggests that Shomrei Asaf means Shomrei Akelim, or the people who watch over the vessels. And he actually takes that from the Korban Pesach, from the sacrificial offering of the Paschal Lamb, where, Utfaltem Badam Asher Basaf, and you will dip the hyssop into the vessel that holds the blood. There's, there's a lot of, interplay between Pesach and Purim here. Um, but to think of him, uh, this is mentioned in a few other places in the commentaries that uh, Shomrei Asaf might mean he who is appointed on the vessels of, of the king or in, or in the Navi and the prophets of the Beit HaMikdash. 
uh, there's another fascinating. All right, I guess uh, just to clarify, so then, it, then it's obvious how they would harm the king, right? They probably just have to drop a you know a bit of poison into the cup that they're going to serve him, and since they're in charge of those cups, that would be the easiest thing in the world for them to do. Yeah, correct. Interesting. That's a, that's a perfect transition. So the, the the Talmud seems to mention that they put poison, the sama mavet, into the into the king's wine. This is obviously uh, also a transition from the famous story about. Uh, the vintner of Paro mm. in Shit in Genesis, where uh, you know the the midrash describes that they a fly flew into the king's cup, yeah. um, and in fact uh, the Ralbag Gersonides, I think is what we call him, um, is uh, says that that they were in fact the uh, the vintners or the saramashkim of the king, mm. which is a little odd. Um, uh, and and there there is a there is a uh, a few other approaches. One calls them the doormen. Uh, mm -hmm. Rashi and the Radak seem to suggest that they are the doormen, or the word Shomer Asaf means doormen. People right. who Asaf could also be the threshold, right? Right, exactly the threshold, uh, or the gatekeepers called Shoarim in some cases. The gatekeepers, you know, people who let people in the castle or don't, which would explain why Mordechai is sitting at the Shar Hamelech at the gate of the king, mm -hmm. and and they were there as well. Um, I'd, I'd humbly suggest a different interpretation that the word Shomrei Asaf, keepers of the Saf, uh, is actually the treasurer, the secretary of the treasury, hmm. uh, or the head of the IRS. And every time you see the word Shomrei Asaf in the prophets, it means somebody taking care of money going to the temple, going to the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, literally every time in, in Sefer Melachim, in Kings 2, um, hmm. and in Rei Ayamim, uh, Shomrei Asaf is Shomrei HaKesef Hamuva Beit Hashem, hmm. right? Or, you know, the Shomrei Asaf take it and say, Vayitnu, right? They put it in the cabinet uh, that had a hole in the side, Chor uh, to transition it. And so I would humbly suggest that they are the uh, secretaries of the treasury. Um, they are the maybe the head of the IRS. Hmm. And uh, they are plotting to kill the king because the economy is in uh, recession which we'll come back to maybe in a second. And Haman, Acharad Vring Ma'ela, immediately thereafter fills their place and he becomes the new finance minister or secretary yeah. of the treasury uh, of Persia. And it would also explain why he was so e easily able to bribe the king with 10,000 silver talents, mm. to bribe the king to kill the Jews, which we'll come to in a second maybe. Oh, fascinating. So do they have, so do they care about Jews? They, the Big Town and Teresh have nothing to do with the Jews, right? They're not. No, these are Persian eunuchs with no children, they care about the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And they are angry at Ahasuerus, uh, his king, for whatever he did, which maybe, maybe we can touch on. Um, and, they, and they want to kill him because he has put the kingdom at risk. Economically. So, I, economically. He's going to drive the politics also. And, yeah. yeah. Got it. So Haman rises to power because of them, but, but he's just like in the right place at the right time. I mean, he, Mordechai is the one who gets rid of them. Yes, but maybe, maybe Haman was a wealthy guy. That's how he got to 10,000 talents. Maybe he had a plan to restore the palace coffers with 10,000 silver talents. Yeah. He had some sort of economic impact on the king, and the king was vulnerable because of a, a down economy uh, in, yeah. in, in Persia at the time. We can prove this in the verses, by the way. The, that the economy is bad. Yeah, we can. Interesting. Well, just before this, he had... Uh... But the king had, uh, had, had given tax relief, right? That was uh... Exactly. The, the king was giving out, you know, we're in the middle of an election in Israel right now, right? What's the first thing the finance minister does as he's We're always in the middle of an election in America, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> What's the first thing that, you know, the finance minister does when he's about to run for election? He gives handouts. Uh... You know, here they give out handouts to the policemen and the, uh, and by the way, the jail keepers. Um, tax reductions. That's what you do. It's election politics. What do you think Trump's uh, going to do for the next election? Give out money. So, right. uh, uh -huh. so you always do. So meaning the king's tax relief is not just a celebration of the new queen, but it's also he's currying favor with the people who actually probably need economic help right now. And that might. Yeah. And I think he thinks that his, 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 his uh, palace chair is rocky. He's mm -hmm. down in the polls. And the reason I think he's down in the polls, you know, it's funny, he makes, the, makes this party that the Megillah calls Mishte Gadol, a great party for Esther, but I think it's sarcastic, and we can prove that, actually, because he makes two parties, or three, actually. 
in the first two chapters, you referenced them. Hmm. Uh, the first party, 180 days, was really a big party. And by the way, they had their Sarav, Avadam, Chel, Paras, Umadaya, Partamim, Saram, Dinot, the ministers, the slaves, and then all of the leaders of the, of the Persian Empire were there and everybody in between. And then he had another party for seven days in which the entire kingdom was invited. That's in the first chapter. But in the second chapter, what do we have? Only the ministers and the slaves. Who's missing? Everybody else. And it's a short party. It's a sarcastic comment. And then he's giving out, you know, populist handouts. Mm -hmm. And so immediately right after, we run into big Tanva Teresh, who are worried about the financial stability of the kingdom due to the small party and the populist policies. And so we got to get rid of the king. So interesting. Um, all right. So what you know do you what think happened there? I don't know. That sounds really fascinating. Um, I, I, you know, I took them as random, but that sounds, uh, you, you actually have a, an explanation for them. So that seems like a better, better way to go. Um, let's actually switch to, to, to chapter six then, where, where, this, where it becomes clear that this is not just an isolated incident that we are wondering why we had to hear about, but actually is important. It may be important, as you're saying, for understanding the politics of the book, uh, and as what's going on in the Persian Empire, but it's really important for the book in terms of uh, Mordechai and his, his fate. Um, so I was, I was recently thinking about chapter six as a, a chapter you could easily read in a few different ways. Um, so maybe before I, before I ask you about how you see that harking back to, uh, to the story in chapter two, uh, let me sketch a couple of ways that you could read the story. So one way to read the story, and this is certainly a way that we find in a lot of the ancient translations, the Midrashim, is that chapter six, which starts on that night, um, the king's sleep was disturbed. by that is where we finally see God. Um, and this is already in the Greek translation. The Greek translation translates it uh, now in English as, uh, on that night, the mighty one kept sleep from the king. And it's like, God is finally stepping in. Uh, and there are you know, a whole series of midrashim and, and comments in the Talmud about how uh, it's not, not just that the king couldn't sleep, but God himself couldn't sleep, uh, that his sleep was actually disturbed. And then they asked like, well, does God ever sleep? Which is an interesting question, but we'll leave it aside. <laughs> Um, maybe no one could sleep. It was a sleepless night for everyone because like here the wheels of uh, divine providence start to turn and this is where the story is going to start to take a, a different, uh, di different direction. Um, there is another, there's at least a couple of other views. Um, one is, and I'm not going to elaborate on it, but one is that like the king is now sleepless because Esther has invited him and Haman to two consecutive feasts and the king is trying to figure out why did Esther want Haman there? Is Haman actually designing uh, to usurp my role? Is he plotting something against the monarchy? Um, and then, again, you know, without belaboring the details, uh, in the chapter when he says, you know, Haman, what would you do for someone if, uh, if they wanted to be honored? And Haman's like, well, you should obviously give, give them royal clothes, put them on a royal horse. And uh, at that point, Ahasuerus is like, oh, I see. This is actually true. This guy wants to be king. We got to figure out what to do with this guy. So that's another way of reading the, the chapter. Yeah, I believe that's Rubba's approach in the Talmud, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, it's at least hinted at, right? It's not so yeah. developed, but it's certainly uh, like the basic idea is there. Yeah. Um, and then a third way, which I, I came across in a medieval commentary by a, a guy named Yosef Nachmias, um, again, not totally developed in this way, uh, but goes as follows. Uh, Esther in the previous chapter, in five, we knew had taken her life into her hands and gone into the throne room. Um, and and uh, she said, I'm risking my life to do this. And, um, and then the king, you know, extends the scepter and everything's good. So we sort of forget about the, the uh, risk to her life. But the king might not have. He's sitting there being like, why, why did she just risk her life to come ask me something? There must have been something really momentous that she wanted to ask. So he gets to the party and he says, look, I'll give you up to half, to the, king half the kingdom. Like, what, what would you like? And she says, tomorrow. So at this point, he's like, what else could she possibly want? I mean, I literally offered her half the kingdom. She is the queen. Why would she not just say what she wants? So he's racking his brain trying to figure out what she could want. And he says, look, I, I, it can't be anything for her because I offered her everything and she didn't take it. So maybe it's on behalf of someone else. Well, who does she know? So he asks his advisors, you know, find out, like, who does she know? Who is she friends with? Like, who has she ever spoken to? 
They say, well, at the beginning, there was this guy, Mordechai Yehudi. He would always come to the gate and ask about her. Um, you know, we could probably dig into that relationship, but like they apparently know each other. So he says, fine, guys, go, go to the archives, go search up anything about Mordechai Yehudi, find out what's going on there. And of course, they dig up the story from five years ago or so uh, of when he saved the king's life um, from Big Tan and Teresh. And the king's like, okay, we got to take care of this because tomorrow Esther is going to ask me for something really huge on behalf of Mordechai. Let me at least make sure that he's been rewarded adequately for saving my life. Uh, one of the really fascinating implications of this is that, you know, then you don't, you don't even need God anymore, right? I mean, then it's like, it actually makes sense. Of course, his sleep was disturbed that night. He has a lot on his mind. And uh, the, the, uh, the archives that dig up something about Mordechai, not so surprising. That's what he's looking for. Um, so I don't know. It's, it just seems like a, a chapter which sort of encapsulates a lot of the ambiguities of the book as a whole. Like a lot of Absolutely. it is just so, it, it's hard to know how to read it. There seem to be so many different ways of reading it. And, and that seems to come to a head in this chapter. I All think right, the, let me throw it back to you. No, no, I think the beauty of the book is as, as literature and as Tanakh, is that it is so ambiguous and suffers so many interpretations. Uh, that's why it's the most commented book probably of all time. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's also accessible uh, in terms of its language, uh, which makes it that. Um, it, to, to my mind, it harkens back to the first part of the story. Why the king woke up is, you know, on that night, Balayla Hahu, it, it's pretty dramatic, right? It's the same night, uh, which in, in which the, the, the request uh, of Esther transpires, basically, right? Right. And, uh, and, uh, and on that night, he, he's awoken. Something is troubling him. And I think he actually feels pangs of moral guilt to the fact that he hadn't taken care of somebody else uh, in the kingdom. And he's not sure what's bothering him. And this, this whole mess uh, has come up. Maybe he dreamed about his, his, his uh, lack of tribute uh, to Mordechai. Hmm. Um, I find it hard to read God into this explanation because he's just absent, uh, from the entire Megillah. And I'm certain that the Greek translators, uh, originally had an interest in putting God into the story for obvious reasons, uh, okay. that we, we probably don't have enough time to talk about here. Uh, um, and he asked that this book, and I find the most interesting, uh, verb used is Vayin Matzei Katuv. He happens to find, hmm that it is written in there, Asher uh, Higid Mordechai al Bigtanava Teresh, that Mordechai told him about Bigtanava Teresh. And these two characters come back again. And, um, and this was the job that Mordechai did, and, you know, in that, he, in that he, he saved the king's life by telling him. By the way, there's no mention of Esther there. Hmm. I think that's not an accident that Esther you is know, not. In chapter right. two, Mordechai had told Esther, who then told the king. Right. The chain of events, right? And just as you said, Mordechai tells Esther, tells the king, she's absent from that story there. Um, and so I think the, who, the, the writer of the Megillah, the author, is, is trying to put Mordechai in this frame with Bigtan and Teresh uh, at that time. And the king, who's probably still suffering through some financial difficulties, as the case may be, and he's got all this on his mind, and he's now at Esther making a party, which is costing a fair amount of money, probably, as often happens at... Uh, you know, White House events when you're not serving fast food, um, <laughs> you, you, you know, he's, he's nervous again. There's, there, there's economic hardship in the kingdom. The queen is spending money on two parties, not one, right? <laughs> and he remembers that his two treasury ministries did this, and Mordechai didn't get the job as a treasury minister. He gave mm. it to Haman. He's still not sure what his financial position is. And he's got all this going on. You know, finances keep people up at night. They do. They do that. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they definitely do. No, it's it's really fascinating because it, it it's an underappreciated facet, right? Of the the econo economics of the story, right? You have the tax relief in chapter two. It ends with taxes in chapter ten. Like this, this focus on money, like it doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's it's really there. It's, let me ask you a question. What do you think the word yikar means in English or in Hebrew, which is mentioned all over the book? Yeah. Word yikar, right? Even in the first chapter, Vachol Hanashim, all the women, Yitnu Yikar Lebalehen will give Yikar right. that their husbands. What do you think that means? I, I mean, all fans I would say something like honor or glory, but you're right. I mean, it extends from like the interpersonal honor to apparently something like grandeur in a palace or something. Yeah, I think it means financial tribute. Ooh. And uh, 
when you think about it, it you know, at that time, there were questions even in the Mishnah about, you know, uh, that uh, a husband gets his woman's, uh-huh. his wife's, uh, the, the, the goods that she makes, that what she makes, because he takes care of her, etc. So, you know, the financial relationship between husband and wife is one that is being decided through those hundreds of years. Yes. And I think in Persia, they want to make sure that the women give financial tribute to the husband. And interestingly, right at the beginning of chapter six, the word yikar is mentioned seven times. Really? You're a professor of Tanakh when it talks about Mordechai. Uh-huh. It's a financial tribute. Uh-huh. In place of having saved the king from, you know, demise at the hand of those plotting to kill uh-huh. him because of financial ruin of the king, and Mordechai is given financial tribute. Seven times you're a professor of uh, Bible. You, you're, you're, you're smarter about those uh, leaning words than I am. Yep. But, uh, I mean, obviously I mean, it's not. fascinating. <laughs> I don't know what to make of it fully, but it's fascinating. That is very really fascinating. So I guess like one minute left. What, uh, how does this all come together? Like on your reading, then there's got to be an economic happy ending also. Um, well, somehow. I, yeah. I, Here's what I think. I recently read something, which I wasn't aware of when I, when I wrote the book by Blaustein and King, which I think is pertinent to our modern times. There are two professors who studied anti-Semitism across Europe on a province-by-province basis. Hmm. Um, and they came to a fascinating conclusion is that anti-Semitism is caused by really two things. Um, one is the delta in immigration of Jews to a given place, and the second is financial demise of that place or financial hardship. And I think... Um, you know, there's no real explanation for anti-Semitism on some level. It's a, kind of almost an inborn hate, but it does find fertile ground uh, in places with uh, large percentages of Jewish immigration versus the current population and then financial issues. And I, I think when we think about the rise of anti-Semitism around the world now and some disadvantaged economic populations around the world, it's something we ought to be paying attention to. Um, and I think, you know, the Haman of that time rose to power you know, after the Jews immigrated from Judea, from Judah, right, to Persia, uh, grew in numbers, and, um, and there was financial hardship in the kingdom, as we discussed earlier. And I, th- I think that finds fertile ground for an Achara Trimaela after these events, Haman rose to power. And uh, yeah. in my view, that part, at least, is a, cautionary, is a cautionary tale. I think the Megillah ends, as you know from my book, in a very different way. But you know, I think captured, I think, um, I find the whole story a terrible tragedy. But um, uh, in that piece of the end of the second chapter to the uh, sixth chapter, I think it's important to look at those dynamics, especially as we think about modern times. Okay. All right. Fantastic. This is a a lot lot of food for thought here. Yeah. What is your thought? How do you pull it all together? Um, Well, I mean, I guess being, uh, you know, sitting here in a university office and you know, not in a venture capital firm. I hadn't thought so much about the money part of things. <laughs> <laughs> More about, uh, you know, diaspora identities and uh, multiculturalism and hybridity and things like that, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's what we're trained to think about. But, yeah. uh, but they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, as, as you said, I think we'll, we'll, we'll end just with observing that the Megillah is, it's an amazingly concise text. And here's also like the Greek text is sort of like, more diffuse, actually less tight, less, uh, it's a worse story as the stories go. The Hebrew text is like really tight until you get to the end, which gets a little bit uh, off rails. But, <laughs> but I think the end's uh, fundamental, but either way. Yeah, no, in chapter nine, just gets, uh, it's very important. It's just the narrative is, is less tight. Um, but the, uh, you know, so packed with, with themes and motifs that are uh, clearly woven together, but also like, ambiguous in an intentional way it's like it's putting a lot out there to be like look life's complicated right this is i think by far the most complicated messiest picture of what it means to live jewish life that we have in in tanakh i mean this is this is like this is our life i mean this is uh you know with all the differences of 2600 years 2500 years of of time but but the, the messiness um like politically spatially geographically economically religiously identity wise like it's just really messy and it's all packed into this like really tightly told story, which I think that you're, you're totally right. I mean, that's why it's actually not boring to come back to Esther like year after year and be yeah. like, what's new this year? Like this is actually, it's a, it's a book that's worth, uh, worth restudying every year. Yeah. Well, thank you, Aaron. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, I recommend to everybody to read your book, Esther. <laughs> ancient thought. It's a well, dense I actually recommend your book. So I'll recommend your book also. 
vanishing Jew, which actually sounds much more ominous, right? Uh, <laughs> I do have an ominous view of the, uh, of, uh, of the text. Yeah, yeah. That is true. All right, excellent. So thanks All for right. taking time out. This is great. Thank Shabbat you. Shalom and uh, happy Purim. You as well.